So it sounds like you have mo something more important to do. Um, so let's dive in. Uh, the topic of this class is um, coming out of Egypt again. Uh, the Exodus story and Passover as a holiday of immigration and refuge. Um, so it's really particularly poignant for me to be talking about this right now. I mean, I, as a person who's been living in Israel for several years and working closely with the uh, asylum seeker and refugee and migrant communities in Tel Aviv, um, every year think about Passover as a holiday uh, for refugees or thinking about refugees. But particularly this year, um, as many of us feel even vulnerable or kind of homeless or in this weird transient situation when we're stuck in our own homes uh, and gets us to thinking differently about what it means to be without a home or without a solid home. Um, and for those who are following the news, um, underneath the headlines of Corona uh, and COVID-19, we're seeing more and more news. I mean, those of us that follow closely the news from refugee communities here in Israel and are, uh, in the US and around the world, um, a lot of migrant communities are really, really struggling and um, there's a lot of fear of what might happen moving forward. Um, particularly in Israel where a lot of the migrant community members, uh, specifically all of the refugees work in restaurants and work in hotels, they've lost their jobs um, and they don't have necessarily the same um, status and access to health, uh, welfare, health services and unemployment services that Israelis do. Um, I know a lot of uh, migrants and refugees in the U.S. are also similarly concerned. Meanwhile, there are many, many refugees in refugee camps across the world that don't have access to running water and are living in spaces with lots and lots of people and cannot easily socially distance themselves. Um, so, um, you know, I, while we think about our own health and safety, I think it's a worthwhile time to think about how we interact with those who don't necessarily have a home to go to and what we can do right now to help them. Um, and when we come out of this current crisis, how we can um, change the way our world is organized a little bit better to support those people. Um, but we're here today uh, to talk about Passover um, and what Passover can teach us, inspire us, um, tell us about how we can interact with refugees, um, about refugees and migration. Uh, and around the world. So let's go back, uh, way, way back when, uh, to the Passover story. And, um, you know, I teach a lot about Judaism and refugee rights. And when I teach about Judaism and refugee rights, I tend to go right to the laws, the laws that talk about loving the stranger, care for the stranger, help the stranger. Um, but because Passover is coming up, I want to take a slightly different approach um, and start with the Passover story itself um, and talk about some of the meanings in this story. And then we'll see how that story unfolds and brings us through a natural development into some of the laws and the customs within the Jewish tradition about how we should relate to the stranger and think about how those, the moral obligation derives from the Passover story or the Passover memory. All right, so what I'm gonna do, um, um, oh, oh, by the way, um, if anybody has comments they want to share either privately, you can put them in the chat or with the whole group, you can also share them in the chat um, or feel free to like raise your hand if you have a question as we go along and then I'll stop for like questions and if comments, a few points along the way. Um, oh, and feel free to be Israeli and just interrupt and unmute yourself uh, along the way. Um, I retain the privilege to mute you. Um, no, but I, I, I love questions and, and interruptions as my students know. Um, though I just wish I had the ability to mute some of my students in actual classes, but what are you going to do? Hey. Um, I would never mute Louis. M mute you, Louis. don't worry. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a, a link to a Google Doc um, where I have my sources into the chat, so you can click on this Google Doc. I'm also going to share my screen. So you can follow along on this shared screen, or you can follow along uh, at your own pace. Um, and... If you get bored, you can skip ahead. Um, okay. Let me zoom in. That might be helpful for those of you that are on handheld devices. 
Right. So I want to start at the very beginning of the Passover story, the beginning of the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus. Um, and this is how the story starts. And I want you to already think about how this relates to refugees or migrants, uh, if at all, today. Verse 8, Exodus chapter 1. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the Israelite people are much too numerous for us. Let us deal shrewdly with them so that they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us and rise from the ground. So they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built garrison cities for Pharaoh, Pitom, and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they increased and spread out, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. Um, anybody want to chime in here and how this might reflect or reverberate for some um, of the way we see political leaders treating minority groups or specifically immigrant groups today? Well, I'll just go ahead and say it. Uh, say, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm gonna say I'm in the US, not Israel, but I mean, I, I think pretty obviously our, our American president is, is much like uh, the new Pharaoh here who, who uh, and, and a lot of his supporters who are, you know, very worried about, uh, you know, uh, refugee populations, especially those coming from south of the, the U.S.-Mexican border, uh, spreading and, and uh, you know, becoming a, a big population. I think that's pretty explicit in what he and his supporters said. So I, I think it's pretty easy comparison. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think in the U.S., as well as many, many places in the world, we're seeing political leaders using specifically immigrants uh, as a political scapegoat. Um, and saying, listen, you know, we have to be afraid, or even if they're not allowed now, they're going to be more of them, and we're going to be overrun, and we're going to become a minority in our own country, um, and we have to be careful. Um, okay, and, so being from Europe, yeah. and the whole issue about closing borders or not closing borders definitely has to do with the immigrants that came over the past few years from the Middle East, because um, there are a lot of people that want to help the immigrants, but there are also a lot of people that are afraid. And they have a reason to be afraid because there, have, there has been a rise in terrorism since the migrants came. However, I guess this will always be, um, be a dilemma. How much are you going to allow and how can you control it? Like over here where it says, um, let us deal shrewdly with them so that they may not increase. Otherwise, in the events of war, they may join our enemies. So I guess nowadays people are still afraid of what the migrants bring with them. No, thank you for raising that. I'm really glad we have this like international collection of perspectives here, right? Now, there are challenges that come with large migration. Um, and sometimes within large migrant groups, there are people that are coming for various reasons or engaged in certain kinds of criminal activity, just like there are in any groups. The question is, how do we deal with those fears, right? And how do we deal with those fears in a smart, rational, balanced way? Um, and don't just fan those fears for, for one's own political gain. Um, and how we find that balance between finding our own sense of security, but not that let coming at the expense of basic human dignity and human life. Um, and I see there's a really interesting so they have this whole process, and it's very interesting, this last sentence here, right? The Egyptians came to dread the Israelites, right? The Egyptians started to fear the Israelites, right? Now, some of that fear might have be based in some degree of reality, but how much of that fear was stoked by the experience and everything that happened and the political changes that happened over time? Um, and what can we do, something that I think about as a refugee <laughs> activist, is how can I deal sometimes with the local populations that are already sometimes disadvantaged? And how do we address the fears and the concerns that they have uh, in, a, in a mindful and heartful way? Um, all right, so that's the beginning of the Passover story. Moving forward to Exodus chapter two. Already, so Moses has a uh, spoiler. There are gonna be some spoilers here, I'm gonna warn you. 
Moses uh, kills the Egyptian, one of the, these Egyptian taskmasters who's beating an Israelite slave, realizes he needs to run away. He becomes a fugitive. He flees, goes to Midian. Um, and here's what happened when he's in the land of Midian. Uh, Midian. Moses consented to stay with the man, the man being uh, Yitro, the chief priest uh, of Midian. And he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah as wife. She bore a son whom he named Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Right, this is one of the first times in the Passover story we hear the word ger, stranger. Um, also sometimes referred to, translated as immigrant, other. Um, and it's interesting for the first time somebody referring to themselves as a ger, a stranger, an immigrant in the pa Passover story is Moses, uh, who himself is a member of the Israelites. Now, an interesting question is, where does he see himself as a stranger, right? The pshat, the, the simple meaning of the text, the easy reading is probably that, oh, probably in Midian he seems himself as a stranger. But maybe even in Egypt he saw himself as a stranger, um, being a member of an, the Israelites who was raised in Pharaoh's uh, Home. Oh. Um, by the way, uh, the first person to refer to himself a ger in the book of Genesis was Abraham, uh, the father of the Israelite people. All right, jumping ahead, uh, we're jumping ahead 10 chapters, uh, 10 plagues, let my people go. We're finally now um, in the night of the 10 plagues. Um, and God tells Moses to tell the people they need to all gather in their homes. They need to put the blood, of, they need to sacrifice uh, a goat or a lamb, and they need to take the blood of that lamb, um, the Paschal lamb, and they need to put it on the doorpost, and they need to eat the lamb inside um, as their, in their family, um, and to have this special ceremonial dinner. And then generations and generations from now, their, their children and their children's children in the land of Israel will have to continue having this ritual. Um, and this is uh, what we're told uh, in pretty much the first set of commandments ever given to the Israelite people, even before they've left Egypt, even before they've come to Sinai, God is commanding them to keep Passover. Um, so in Passover is in many ways like the first part of the first chunk of commandments. Um, okay. No leaven shall be found in your houses for seven days. For whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the community of Israel, whether he is a stranger, a ger, or a citizen of the country. Right? So this already implies that about hundreds of years from now or generations from now, you're going to sit down and have a meal. And in your community, as part of your community, you're going to have people who are not Ezrachim, who are not citizens, who are not native born, but are gerim, strangers, immigrants who join your community. And it's already foreseeing this. Well, they're still slaves in Egypt. It's already foreseeing that one day they're gonna be their own community. And in that community, they are going to have um, some minority immigrants, but those minority need to be a part of the community and take part in those community practices. I don't know how immigrants in Israel today feel about having to eat matzah on Passover and not getting access to bread, but it's an interesting idea. Um, let's jump ahead um, to Exodus uh, 13. Uh, so this is we're jumping ahead one chapter. So again, this is the night, the Passover night, where God is passing through the land, um, slaying the firstborn. Um, and this is another commandment he gives to the people of Israel. The Lord spoke further to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me every firstborn, man and beast. The first issue among the womb of, of every womb among the Israelites is mine. And to this day in the Jewish tradition, we have the tradition of Pidion Haben. Um, the firstborn son needs to be redeemed um, from service to God. Um, and Moses said to the people, Remember this day on which you went free from Egypt, the house of bondage, how the Lord freed you from it with a mighty hand. No leavened bread shall be eaten. You go free on this day in the month of Aviv. So when the Lord has brought you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall observe in this month the following practice. Okay, when we do go into our own land, what do we have to do? Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a festival of the Lord. Throughout the seven days, unleavened bread shall be eaten. No leavened bread shall be found with you, 
and no leaven shall be found in all your territory. And you shall explain to your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I went free from Egypt. And this shall serve you as a sign on your hand, as a reminder on your forehead, in order that the teaching of the Lord may be in your mouth, that with a mighty hand the Lord freed you from Egypt. You shall keep this institution at its set time from year to year. I want to read this line in the Hebrew, the bolded line, verse 8 in Hebrew. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Maybe from a book that we tend to read on Seder night? The Haggadah. Exactly. Right? So this passage is the Haggadah, and we talk about the four children and how you need to tell the four children and explain to each one a different way about the Passover story. Behigadeta levanecha, or levincha, right? The Hebrew verb there is lehagid, to tell. That is the root from which we get the word hagada, which means telling, right? So pretty much here we have the commandment of doing a Passover Seder. And what is the main point of doing a Passover Seder? Of telling the story to future generations. Why? Why are we telling this story? Because there's a very weird thing happening here in the Hebrew um, that doesn't quite come across in the translation. I'll read the Hebrew again. And you shall tell your son on this day as follows. So this is the new JPS translation, the new Jewish public uh, Jewish Publication Society translation. And it goes for a more poetic translation here rather than a hyperliteral. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I went free from Egypt. But I would actually translate it differently. I would translate it as a It is for this that the Lord did for me and took me out of Egypt. In other words, why did the Lord take me out of Egypt? So that Hundreds of years from now, we'll have this weird meal and this weird ritual, and my children will ask me, why are we doing this? And I will tell them that God took us out of Egypt. So why did God take us out of Egypt? So that we can tell our children that we were taken out of Egypt. Why? Because there's a moral lesson to be had here. How are you supposed to find that this for me? Sorry. Hey, come here. Wait a minute, somebody is, I'm gonna mute Jane. You can unmute yourself if you wanna to speak to the group. Um, okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna back up a little bit more uh, why I think that the, the, the moral, the message of Passover is to remind us to build a society um, that treats strangers and immigrants differently by jumping just a few chapters forward. Um, we have uh, now Exodus, exited Egypt. Um, this is now revelation. We have come to Mount Sinai, right? Um, maybe um, several weeks, 40 days, right? Um, after um, they, um, got, they left Egypt, they've gotten to Mount Sinai, right? They've gone through the, the, the Red Sea. They've seen their Egyptian enemies, the soldiers of Egypt, you know, washed away. Uh, in the sea. Um, and then we have the beginnings of the commandments. This is Parashad Mishpatim, a set of ethical commandments that comes right after the Ten Commandments. Verse 20. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not treat any widow or orphan. If you do mistreat them, I will heed their outcry as soon as they cry out to me, and my anger shall blaze forth, and I will come to you I will put you to the sword and your own wives shall become widows and your children orphans. All right, not the most uplifting um, way of talking about love and treating strangers. Um, but already here we have some interesting tropes that are going to appear again and again throughout the Bible, right? You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. When these words were spoken, you know, according to the biblical narrative at Sinai, the people hearing these words were strangers in the land of Egypt. It was literally true for them, right? 
but you are not going to do what the Egyptians did to you. You are going to do something different because what happened when you were impressed? You cried out to God and God heard your cry and God smote the Egyptians. But God does not want to smite the Israelites. He wants the Israelites, God wants the Israelites to build a different kind of society that treats not only strangers, but widows, orphans, people that were disadvantaged better. Um, the Egyptian society, from what we know, is a very, very hierarchical society, right? Where the Pharaoh is considered a god. But here they're trying to build a society that's less hierarchical, that instead of building all these castes, is all about lifting up the downtrodden, because that's who God cares about. God is not closest to the king. God is closest to the widow, the stranger, the orphan. That's the one God is listening to. And because we're supposed to be like God, that's the one that we're supposed to listen to and take care of. Okay. Um, next chapter. You shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the life of the stranger, having yourselves been strangers in the land of Egypt. I'll read that one in Hebrew. Plural. Um, jump ahead to the next book of the Bible, Leviticus. This is part of Parashat um, Kedoshim, where we have the holiness code with a whole bunch of different uh, ethical and moral commandments. When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not wrong him. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as one of your citizens. You shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Jump forward a few more chapters. You shall have one standard for stranger and citizen alike. I am the Lord your God. Jump forward to the book of Numbers. In the midst of the section all about sacrifices, we have this little parenthetical comment. And when throughout the ages, a stranger who has taken up permanent residence with you or one who lives among you would present an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord, as you do, so shall it be done by the rest of the congregation. There shall be one law for you and for the resident stranger. It shall be a law for all time throughout the ages. You and the stranger shall be alike before the Lord. The same ritual and the same rule shall apply to you and to the stranger who resides among you. Um, now already, we're not just talking about you personally today. We're talking about you and forever. For all generations, you need to treat the stranger because you, even though maybe not you literally, but you figuratively were strangers in the land of Egypt. All right. Fifth book of the Bible. Now we got four out of five books of the Bible talking about um, how we should treat the stranger. For the Lord your God is supreme, and Lord supreme, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who shows no favor and takes no bribe, but upholds the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and loves the stranger, providing him with food and clothing. You too must love the stranger for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, right? Here we have this all powerful, supreme, mighty God. And what does he care about with, what does this God care about with God's power? He cares about the stranger, the widow, the orphan. It's not about accumulating more power, or using the power to harm others. It's actually using that power to help those who have the least. That's what it means to have power, at least in the Deuteronomic godly sense. Okay. So now we've had a bunch of, Actually, maybe I'll pause here for a second. Comments, question, anybody notice any patterns, either similarities or differences between, between these different verses? Um, I have a comment. Yeah. I just want to comment on the use of you here, how in the Bible, it's, it like precedes generations. It doesn't matter that this occurred to the Israelites thousands of years ago. It's talking to us as a people today. Um, and like, it's, it's really emphasizing how this historical story, like the trials and tribulations that we face as a people generations ago, should still remind us of how to act today. It's not just like, it's not left in history. Mm -hmm. right. um, you know, there's a saying, um, it's often attributed to Ben Gurion, but I think it goes back farther, that Jews don't have history, Jews have memory, right? And history is something that you read about in a book. But memory is something that is etched in your mind that affects the way that you live your life, right? And especially for those of us, you know, at the secular yeshiva who don't necessarily believe or follow or care whether these things literally historically happen, to our memory, they are true. 
we must remember that we were slaves in the land of Egypt because that affects how we live our life. And we must live our life with the memory and the moral implications of that memory that we were slaves in the land of Egypt. And you're right, when this was the target audience here, right, isn't just the people there then. The target audience is people all generations. You are slaves in the land of Egypt. And sometimes it's interesting. Sometimes it appears in the singular form. Sometimes it appears in the plural form. You are y'all, right? Ata, atem, we're slaves in the land of Egypt. And for those of us who are taking maybe like a, a modern critical approach, right? This is something that we assume was written years later, these events supposedly understood. But the people writing this and the people saying this and the people hearing this believe this was their story. This was their moral obligation to remember that they were slaves in the land of Egypt. Um, okay. Um, thank you, Kali. So any other questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, reflections on these series of uh, quotes? I will just say, you know, I do a lot of teaching with these different quotes, but in preparation for this class, I decided to go back to every single one of them and look at them in their context. And it's actually really interesting how each one of them, it appears in a slightly different context. One is in a context talking about sacrifices. One is a context talking about um, thievery and robbery. One is a context talking about general ethical laws. And why this repetition comes in a different place, what meaning that has. Um, I encourage you to, you know, if you have some time over the next few weeks, not really going out anywhere, that might be something interesting to look at. All right, so we've had all these lovely verses about um, loving the stranger, taking care of the stranger, but, you know, things get a little bit complicated. Um, all right, Deuteronomy 23, verse four. So here we are just a few chapters ahead in Deuteronomy. No Ammonite or Moabite. The Ammonites and Moabites are people who lived uh, in Transjordan, east of the Jordan River. No Ammonite or Moabite shall be admitted into the congregation of the Lord. None of their descendants, even in the 10th generation, shall ever be admitted into the congregation of the Lord because they did not meet you with food and water on your journey after you left Egypt. And because they hired Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor of Aram Naharain to curse you. But the Lord your God refused to heed Balaam. Instead, the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you, for the Lord your God loves you. You shall never concern yourself with their welfare or benefit as long as you live. Wait a minute, what, what happened to love the stranger? Um, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your kinsman. You shall not abhor an Egyptian, for you were a stranger in his land. Children born to them may be admitted into the congregation of the Lord, in the third generation. Um, so, wait a minute, what's going on here? We're supposed to love the stranger, but not those Ammonites or Moabites. We're supposed to love the stranger? Okay, we can love the Edomite. We can even, we're not supposed to hate the Egyptian. Wait, what? The Egyptians? who are oppressors in Egypt for hundreds of years and who God smote, we're not supposed to hate them? We're supposed to not hate them because we were strangers in their land? What do you make of this? I guess maybe I'll phrase the question another way. Oh, Dan, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, so from, and, and I'm not perfect in this, I, I might've gotten it wrong, but so from reading the right. Torah, I think these were considered like particularly evil groups of people, right? Like they were sacrificing kids and or it was in the Canaanites or I forget who, but I mean, some of them were particularly evil people. And as I understood it, this is sort of a specific moment in time, right? Where it applied then, but never again. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on how you look at it and what part of the Bible you read, right? This part of the Bible seems to not really like the Ammonites or the Moabites, right? Um, also, if you read uh, certain chapters of Genesis, uh, the Ammonites and the Moabites were supposedly descended of Lot's daughters who had sex with their father when they thought the world was coming to an end. Um, but the Bible doesn't really say so many awful things about the Ammonites and the Moabites, except the fact that they did not meet us with food and water on our journey after we left Egypt. I don't know, it seems to me like hundreds of years of active oppression, not giving us food and water when we left Egypt. 
hundreds of years of active oppression and slavery and attempted genocide, not giving us food and water when we left Egypt. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, it's especially when you think about, you know, other times in Jewish history, like the thing when, when I read this, I cannot help but think about the Holocaust, right? And I feel like the equivalent here of the Egyptians would be uh, the Nazis, right? The, or let's say the Germans, right? The entire Egyptian people, right? For all generations. We should not hate the descendants of the Egyptians because we were strangers in the land. But the Ammonites and the Moabites are, let's say, oh, I don't know, other countries that didn't let in Jewish refugees uh, during the time of the war, right? That would be the U.S., right? I mean, U.S. Can't, I mean, every country in the world, pretty much, um, except to some degree the Philippines, China, and the Dominican Republic. Albania. Wait, right, Albania. Um, so interesting. So from a um, so from like a, a moral, like traditionalist reading, the sin of the Ammonites and the Moabites was worse than what the Egyptians did. Because um, they took advantage of, uh, they had no reason to fear the Israelites that were just passing through. Um, they were, you know, a wee, feeble group of refugees just looking for safety. And they tried to make their lives difficult. Um, as opposed to the Egyptians that were dealing with a sizable minority living in their own land. Interesting. Uh, historical approach, especially when you look at the book of Ruth, for example, Ruth was a Moabite. Um, historical approach is that um, this particular text was written at a time when uh, the Israelites were trying to form a political allegiance with Edom and with the Egyptians against the Adamites, uh, sorry, the, Ammonite, the Ammonites and the Moabites. Um, so here we have them kind of like reading back into their own memory. Well, why do we hate the Ammonites and the Moabites? Oh, because back in the day, they screwed us over. Um, we, of course, never see this happening in modern times, right? Certain groups of immigrants or certain people being our allies and friends while others being unacceptable. Um, and then reading this back into our own history. Um, like, where were the Kurds at Normandy, you know? Um, it's almost about 1984, right? Like reading our, our political allegiances of today into the past. Um, but either way, you know, some of us, um, especially in like progressive liberal Jewish circles, we love to skip over these parts. We love to read the love your stranger, love your neighbor, blah, 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 and skip over the hate, you know, the Ammonite and the Moabite and never help them. Um, but these are all parts of our tradition. I think it's important to know that within our Jewish tradition, we have parts that are very love the stranger, but we also have parts that are problematic. And even throughout our tradition, there have been times when we held grudges against certain kinds of people. Um, and question, one question that I ask myself today is which part of our tradition do I wish to raise up and highlight and which part of our tradition do I want to less highlight? Um, I like this part about love. I mean, it's actually really, really, really difficult commandment to not hate the person who oppressed you. Um, at the same time, it's hard not to hold grudges uh, against whole groups of people. All right, I wanna keep moving. Um, just a few verses down, there's uh, a commandment that's often skipped over, but I think is very relevant for our day and time. Uh, it's the commandment regarding the fugitive slave. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 16. You shall not turn over to his master, a slave who seeks refuge with you from his master. He shall live with you at any place he may choose among the settlements in your midst, wherever he pleases. You must not ill treat him. This is way more specific than the do not oppress the stranger, love the stranger. This is a very specific case of somebody who has fled slavery. Um, specifically, it seems like they were fleeing for their life. Um, right? It says in Hebrew, a sher yinatzel, a slave who was saved unto you. Right? Now, I hate to admit it, but there was slavery in biblical Israel. But Maimonides, for example, who comments on this hundreds of years later, said, you know, it, it makes sense that slaves would flee to Israel when they were looking for safety because Israel had more progressive slave laws at that time, right? Even though today we believe that slavery is abhorrent in any form, right? Um, here, that seemed like the people of Israel had more progressive slave laws and then people would seek refuge. Non-Israelites would come to seek refuge among the people of Israel. Um, and I think this is a really, you know, sometimes in Israel, we have discussions about what to do with refugees. And people say, love the stranger. Oh, what does it mean to love? I have to love this person too. But this is something very, very specific that you can't deny. 
right? This person, let's say, came from Eritrea. They fled slavery to the regime in Eritrea, right? They came here, they're seeking refuge. Um, and this is actually something that uh, human rights NGOs in Israel have used in arguing before the Supreme Court, um, arguing not only for non-deportation, arguing also for freedom of mobility, access to welfare, and um, other basic services. We kind of actually have, I would say, a whole summary of international refugee rights law in two verses of the Bible, right? We have the main right of refugees, which is the right of non refoulement the right not to be deported, the right of mobility, the right of residency, um, and right of non-discrimination. Um, it's interesting. Um, and why is that? Because we were slaves in the land of Egypt. And Slavery in ancient Israel might have been an economic thing of an economic matter of indentured servitude, but it was not a matter that was supposed to reduce the inherent worth of a person. Okay, let's jump ahead. Um, I'm a big Bible guy, but I've been told that I cannot skip a rabbinic literature, especially when it comes to Passover, because what is the Haggadah but the rabbis sitting around and talking? about the Bible and talking about the Passover story and how do they interpret it? And what messages do they read from the story for their own day? So um, I picked just a couple of passages here. Um, one is from the Talmud and one is from the Haggadah. Um, here we go, from Babylonian Talmud, Baba Metzia 59b. It is taught, Rabbi Eliezer, my namesake, Rabbi Eliezer the Great used to say, why does Torah warn in 36 places, and some say in 46 places, concerning the ger, translated as the stranger or convert? Because his inclination is toward evil. That should be a statement, not a question. All right, so here we have a question and an answer. You know, why do Jews always answer questions with questions? Why not? Um, so, very often the rabbis ask questions because things in the text are bothering them um, and they just have to talk about it or they have an answer, a message they want to tell and they ask the right questions in order to get to that answer, um, which is this, I'm not sure. But first of all, it does kind of beg questions when commandments regarding the stranger repeat more than any other in the Bible. I mean, we saw some of these. They seem very repetitive, sometimes one chapter after the other. Why does it repeat so many times? Rabbi Eliezer's answer is, the Hebrew is because his inclination is toward evil. It's something that's very difficult to translate. I've generally seen this interpreted as Rabbi Eliezer actually taking um, a more conservative, uh, fearful approach towards the stranger or the convert or the immigrant saying, listen, they already have a bad inclination. So if you oppress them, they're going to act out on it and they're going to regress and that's going to be bad. Um, I really don't like that interpretation, though that's the interpretation that most of, or most rabbis followed. Um, I think it's actually talking about human nature and human inclination, and that all human beings have an inclination towards fear, evil, and oppressing the stranger, right? This is one of the most basic human fears, xenophobia, the fear of that which is other, that which is different. And the reason the Bible warns us again and again and again and again about this because this is a natural human response to fear the stranger, to hate the stranger, the other. And the Bible is trying to combat it by repeating this again and again and again in many different forms in many different places. Now we have another question following up on that. Why is it written, do not wrong a stranger and do not oppress him for you were strangers in the land of Egypt? In other words, why doesn't it just say, do not wrong a stranger? Why does it have to add this, you are a stranger's land of Egypt? This is a question, by the way, that I find arises a lot when I teach interfaith groups um, and people who are not from the Jewish faith say, why doesn't it just say, do not wrong a stranger? Because this whole being a stranger's land of Egypt, that's not my narrative, that's not my memory. Um, and here we go, Rabbi Natan has an answer. It is taught, Rabbi Natan used to say, do not accuse your neighbor of a fault that is in you. The Hebrew is, mum shebacha, which I think is kind of the Hebrew way of saying people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, right? We'd be hypocrites if we treated the strangers poorly, right? Because our whole foundation story is that we were a group of slaves in Egypt and we were oppressed and God took us out of there. And that's how we became a people. And if we go and oppress strangers, then we're, we're, 
we're just as bad as the Egyptians. Um, and we have no right to sit at the Seder table every year and talk about how the Egyptians oppressed us. Um, which is this interesting kind of like Jewish guilt way of getting people to love the strangers. Ah, you're a, you know, it's a, you're a chutzpah dick. If you're a chutzpah, if you sit around and, you know, uh, kvetch about the Egyptians and you do go and do the same thing. But I think he's actually saying something deeper about human empathy, um, which kind of reminds me of something that Rabbi Hillel said, right? What is hateful unto you, do not do unto others. That's like Hillel's golden rule. Um, and he's saying, we're, we need to look at ourselves and we realize this xenophobia thing, this fear of the stranger, this tendency of hitting the stranger, we're no different from the Egyptians. We have that same fear. The question is, what are we going to do with it? And we are commanded to act differently. We can't necessarily control our feelings. We're human just as they are. And we, just as we have the capacity to be persecuted, we also have the capacity to oppress and fear and hate the stranger. That fault exists within us. So we can't go, oh, those Egyptians, they were evil oppressors. No, they were human beings um, that feared the stranger just like we do, but they built a society that turned those fears into policy um, and harmed us. And we need to build a different kind of society. Um, which brings me to the Haggadah. In every generation, one must see oneself as if having left Egypt oneself. As it is written, and you shall explain to your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I went free from Egypt. Sound familiar? So here, what the Haggadah is highlighting is that we're commanded in the Bible to tell our children as if we ourselves were there. It's that I, I um, first person singular, when I left Egypt, but there's also within this verse, this understanding that this is why God took me out of Egypt. So I can tell you this story. And here we go. So it was not our ancestors alone whom the most holy one, blessed one redeemed, but we also were redeemed with them, as it is said, and we were brought out of there that we might be brought to the land promised to our ancestors. Right? Why did God bring us out there? To bring us to the promised land. Why did God bring us to the promised land I'm actually going to jump back for one second, back to the Bible, to another biblical verse, one of the few biblical verses that actually appears in the Haggadah. Um, and this is actually comes from the ritual of the first fruits, which normally takes place in Shavuot, which when you come to this land, so God is supposedly telling the people of Israel, while they're still in Egypt, right, or wandering through the desert, when you come to this land and you have fruit and vegetables and all these things, then you have to go to the temple and you have to say this. You shall recite uh, verse five in Deuteronomy 26. You shall then recite as follows before the Lord your God. My father was a fugitive Aramean. He went down to Egypt with meager numbers and sojourned there. But there he became a great and populous nation. The Egyptians dealt harshly with us and oppressed us. They imposed heavy labor upon us. We cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our plea and saw our plight, our misery and our oppression. The Lord freed us from Egypt by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm and an awesome power, and by signs and portents. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Wherefore, I now bring the first fruits of the soil, which you, O Lord, have given me. You shall leave it before the Lord your God and bow low before the Lord your God. And you shall enjoy together with the Levite and the stranger in your midst, all the bounty that the Lord your God has bestowed upon you and your household. Right, so when we get to our land and God has given us this land, this great bounty and we harvest and we farm and we finally get to bring it, we don't just eat it, we bring it to the temple and we say to, the, to God, or we say, I came out of Egypt and God gave me this and brought me to this land and I have to share it with a stranger in my midst. To remind me that I wasn't brought out of Egypt just to create another society like Egyptian society. I was brought out of Egypt so that I can be a part of a society that's different from Egypt, that treats strangers differently. Very next verse. When you have set aside in full the tenth part of your yield, we're talking about the tithes, like the 10% tax, in the third year, the year of the tithe, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat their fill in your settlements. You shall declare before the, your God, before the Lord your God, I have cleared out the consecrated portion of the house, and I've given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. 
just as you commanded me, I have neither progressed nor neglected any of your commandments. These things are inextricably linked with everything we do connected to our land. We need to remember that our connection to this land isn't unconditional. Our connection to this land is conditioned that we treat this land and the society that we build here differently than the one we were fleeing. I have not eaten of it while in mourning. I have not cleared out any of it while I was unclean and I have not deposited any of it with the dead. That's something the Egyptians used to do, deposit food and valuable items with the dead. But we are a society that celebrates life, not death. I have obeyed the Lord my God. I have done just as you commanded me. Look down from your holy abode from heaven and bless your people Israel and the soil you have given us, a land flowing with milk and honey as you swore to our fathers. Right? It's not an unconditional bond. We were given this land that we follow God's covenant and the most important commandment in God's covenant is to care for the downtrodden and the oppressed. All right, I'm gonna pause here. Comments, questions, concerns. I've got a question or comment. Go for it. So in my experiences in trying to be active in some of this issue here in Israel, and then also being um, connected to the larger uh, religious, like sort of normative Orthodox Middle Eastern communities, there's a lot of discussion about how do we define specifically this gear? How do we specifically define this stranger? And that right. as a way of sort of, disregarding the validity or applicability of these passages to the issue at hand. Uh, I'm curious how we can maybe sharpen that a bit from these beautiful passages to something that we know for sure really connects to, to these issues. Beautiful, right? That's a question that I hate and love, right? Progressive Jews love to like read the Bible and interpret on our own because we believe that, you know, we can interpret. Um, but for those who live in a traditionalist Orthodox tradition, you believe you, one doesn't have the authority to interpret the Bible. One needs to listen to the rabbis. Okay, when we look at the Talmud, the rab, there are a lot, a lot of debates about how you should treat the ger and what the ger even means. But it seems like if you read the Bible, in the Bible, it's pretty clear that ger means immigrant, just like we were immigrants in the land of Egypt, right? As opposed to the ezrach, who is the native born. The word ezrach actually comes from the botanical term uh, for uh, an indigenous plant. Right, so in the most Near Eastern societies, you had huge caste systems between those that were born there and those who were not born there. Um, so it's pretty clear from the biblical context, especially because the Bible says we were gerim in the land of Egypt. We didn't convert to Egyptianism, right? According to the tradition, we kept our cultures in Egypt. But during um, Talmudic times, pretty much the definition of ger changed from the immigrant to the convert, because the Jews were no longer living in national sovereignty in the land of Israel. So what does it mean for someone to join your community? It's not somebody immigrating to your community, it's somebody, well, they had to create new mechanisms of conversion. Conversion, by the way, is a whole diaspora phenomenon. Ruth didn't go through a tradition, through a rabbinic conversion ceremony. She said, all right, I'm joining your people, I'm in. Um, so for most of rabbinic literature, ger is understood as the convert, the somebody that went through the rabbinic process of converting to the religion of Judaism and joining the Jewish people. Now here we are in the land of Israel again. The Jews are a majority here. Um, and I think one problem is the rabbinic community in Israel tends to stick to that diaspora rabbinic definition of a ger, which is somebody going through this religious conversion process. But I think now that we're living in national sovereignty, I think we need to reinterpret Gare the way it meant in the Bible, which is the immigrant. Um, and uh, it's not an easy argument to fight, but I think it's an important <laughs> one to have. Um, well, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, all right. So right, I see we're getting close to 1030, and I know some people have to go, but some people are able to stay on a little bit. Um, so what I'll do is this. I kind of want to end with my, like, closing uh, point um, and kind of, all right, for those of us who are thinking about refugees in the world today, what can we do at our Seder um, to, to bring refugees and bring the voices of refugees into our Seder? Um, so, and then I'll say who anybody wants to stick around and continue discussing or ask questions, I can stay on for another, you know, well, as long as people want to chat, I got nowhere else to go. Um, but, um, I have some modern sources here at the end of the source sheet. Um, here we go, the last source, last but definitely not least, 
um, source on the source sheet is from Utasim Ali, um, a very, very dear friend of mine and inspiration. Uh, Mutasim is uh, a man who uh, grew up in Darfur, Sudan. Uh, he fled the genocide in Darfur. He was a political activist in Sudan. He had to flee Sudan because he was uh, persecuted by the regime and targeted by the regime. He came to Israel specifically because he learned the story and history of the Jewish people. And he felt like the only people in the world that would understand him as a genocide survivor were the Jewish people. He came to Israel um, and he was in turn in the Holot Detention Center. Um, and um, Mutasim and I co-organized together with a whole group of refugee activists and Israelis and others, uh, a Seder, a few days before Passover outside this refugee detention center. Um, and this was an excerpt from his speech. Um, Passover is the time for the Jewish people everywhere to tell the story of their liberation from Egypt and celebrate the value of freedom. It is also a time, I hope, that they can consider the freedom of others. Passover is an opportunity to look at how Israel is detaining people who have come to it for shelter and ask whether such policies are in line with the Jewish spirit. Um, my teacher at Bina Dov Elboim likes to think of Seder night as kind of a group therapy night. We sit around the circle and we talk about our memories and we talk about our history, the good, the bad, the beautiful, the ugly, but hopefully we come out of this therapy stronger and better and healed from the traumas of the past and able to come to a place of empathy and not fear. Um, and I know many of us are sitting in our homes this Passover, just kind of like that very first Passover night during the night of the 10th plague, stuck in our homes, fearful of what will be. But I think within the Seder, within the Haggadah, and within the Jewish tradition, we have an invitation to grapple with those fears. Like uh, Ella was saying earlier, these fears are real. And we need to grapple with them. We need to not ignore them. But hopefully, we could, by talking about these fears, we can come out the other side and come through our experience to a place of love and compassion and not to a place of hate and anger. Um, so um, for those of you who are, that are looking for resources and tools to bring voices of refugees into your Seder and consider uh, the well-being of others uh, at your Seder table, there are a few different resources. Um, so first of all, I have here, um, Bina has a, what we call our Passover Seder bookmarks, little bookmarks that you can print out and put in between the Seder pages that relate to different is contemporary issues and how they relate to the gutta, like refugees, like women's issues. Um, and you can also follow us on Facebook for different insights um, and other uh, Torrentine classes. HIAS, uh, the Jewish Refugee Agency, which is an American agency, but they do work all over the world, have a beautiful a refugee Haggadah that brings in different refugee voices from refugees around the world. And I also encourage you to follow them on Facebook to understand what are different issues that they're dealing with with refugees right now on um, the, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and uh, right now, Advocates for Asylum Seekers in Israel um, is a small organization um, that I'm involved with. It specifically works to advocate and bring attention to asylum seekers and refugees in Israel. They have a small, like a two-page Haggadah supplement, specifically that talks about stories of refugees in Israel. And if you want to follow the latest news about what's happening with refugees in Israel and what you can do to help, um, you can follow there. Um, so um, for those who have to go, I'm going to say um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I want to wish everyone a safe, healthy, and happy Passover. Um, and also bless you that you'll be able to come through this stronger and healthier uh, and be able to use this time to think about how you and we all as individuals are going to live our lives differently, have been through this period of Egypt, this period of narrowness and challenge, um, and engage with our world differently when we come out the other end. Um, I want to share with you a beautiful song and music video by Alma Zohar, an Israeli artist, where she took the words of the Haggadah to apply to um, uh, refugees and asylum seekers coming to Israel today. Um, so I'm going to share that with you now. Um, but if anybody has to go, um, I won't take it personally. Um, say hi to the queen for me. Um, and also, if people have questions, meanwhile, I see some people are posting some questions in the chat. Um, feel free to post publicly or privately. Um, oh, I just have to answer this question that Kylie asked. <laughs> really important question, she asked me privately. How did Ruth the Moabite enter the congregation of the Lord, despite what Deuteronomy 23 says? 
Um, right, because Deuteronomy 23 says, up until 10 generations, a Moabite cannot enter the congregation of the Lord. Um, but then we have the book of Ruth, which talks about Ruth, who is this wonderful woman who helped her mother-in-law, Naomi. Not only does she join the congregation, her great-grandson, three generations away, becomes King David. Um, and um, the rabbinic answer is because Rubert, and Ruth was a Moabitess, Moavia, a female Moabite. So the law doesn't apply to her. Um, <laughs> but a maybe more historic or secular answer is that the story of Ruth the Moabite was told at a different time. Um, and the person who told that story had a different understanding and a different experience of Moabites. It was told at a time possibly when many Jews were returning from the Babylonian exile and they had taken Moabite wives. And the fact of the matter was, there they were, they were wonderful wives, they were supporting their families, and here they were turning to Israel. And what, they were going to turn them away? So this story was told. Um, and this story tells a very different story about a wonderful Moabite woman who helped the Jewish people, and not only helped the Jewish people, her great-grandson was the greatest king ever. Um, and I think one message that I take this from the story is we have all these laws on one hand, but we have the stories on the other hand. We have the halakha and we have the agadah. And sometimes what's more powerful than the laws are the stories that we tell. We can say, oh, love the stranger, love the stranger, love the stranger, as a law, as a law, as a law, but then to actually remember and tell our own stories or to meet a refugee and hear their story. That is incredibly powerful in an entirely different way. So that's why I encourage you also this Passover to try to bring refugee stories and not just facts and figures uh, into your Seder. All right, I'm gonna show you, uh, I'm gonna show you this film. Actually, I'm gonna copy and paste these tools here and then I'm gonna show you the music video. It's very short, let's see here. Okay, new screen share. And I'd love to get your thoughts after. תמיד יש מלחמה באפריקה, מזל שהיא רחוקה, שלא רואים ולא שומעים אותה מכאן. Adam Lirotatsmo Keilu 
Right, I guess. Oh, yeah. Hi, Elliot. Yeah, Danny, go ahead. Okay, if no one else wants to say something. You know, I think it's very, we should be mindful of this time of year. Uh, we have sponsored, uh, among others, four young men who were due to come to Toronto uh, this month, uh, either before or after Pesach. We were beginning to get all the processes underway uh, to welcome them, he them here. Then, of course, the world changed. And not only did the world change, but they also lost their jobs. So we now have uh, four who are coming now, as well as several other families and, and, and single guys coming a year or two from now, all of whom now are in a very difficult situation. Hopefully, uh, if they get some money from their accounts, from the tax deposit accounts, uh, they can survive uh, and survive without any difficulty. But obviously, uh, there's going to be some real problems in part of that community, especially among single mothers and others who did not have luxury of having good jobs for these past three years. So I think we have to think about them and think about them. I think Israelis have to think about the potential of people being kicked out in the streets and starving in the streets during a Passover holiday. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, I, especially as watching this video again, I haven't watched it in a long time. Yeah. Um, I was thinking actually about like, I know one of the kids, kids, I mean, he's already a young adult now in particular, who's, you know, supposed to be going to Canada, uh, one of your sponsees. And his story is actually very similar uh, to the story of the kid in the video. Mm. Um, who came, ended up becoming Israel alone as a child. Um, and he was, uh, ended up alone, homeless in the park in Tel Aviv, but he ended up learning Hebrew, um, getting a job, getting an education. Um, and now we're worried that people like him who have come very, very far in the last 10 years are going to be ending up uh, back where they were 10 years ago. Um, we hope it doesn't come to that point. Um, so I think it's really important that people keep following the news and find ways to either advocate uh, to make sure that these people are included, just like other citizens of Israel, in government efforts to keep our society afloat in these challenging times, um, and perhaps also make, with direct financial support um, so that people mm -hmm. don't have hungry again. 
Um, you know, we say at our Seder night, Kol yechol, let all who are hungry come and eat. Um, and actually, you know, something about Seder night, every family was supposed to sacrifice a lamb, but, and you're supposed to eat it all before morning, but not every family can eat a whole lamb themselves. So they were supposed to invite other families to join them um, to make sure everything was eaten and nobody went hungry and no food was wasted. We can't do that this year um, because of um, social distancing. But maybe we can donate the equivalent money um, of what it'd be like to host a family at our Seder this year to make sure at least other families don't go hungry in this Passover. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. And by the way, if people want to uh, get involved uh, or learn more about what Danny is doing, you can follow uh, on Facebook, Hi, Canadians Helping Asylum Seekers in Israel. Um, if there's anybody here in Canada or with Canadian family or relatives uh, who wants to help sponsor refugees to come from Israel, you can talk to Danny, or you can also financially support uh, the sponsorship work that they're doing. So uh, yeah. thank you, Danny. Thank you. Uh, one family they actually arrived two weeks ago, just, just a few days before the, uh, the flights were, were stopped. And we managed, uh, as a news of social distancing, what, what was going on, we managed to take them around. Uh, have a, they have the our department, they got all the stuff they need, and hopefully uh, in their local community they can still go shopping because Canada is not quite as bad, Toronto is not quite as bad as it is in Israel. Uh, but, you know, you think about how close they, this family was to being in a perilous situation, and now they're here. So yeah. it's the luck of the draw, it's, it's, it's timing. Uh, for some it worked out, others we hope it will work out in a few months from now, but we hope there's, there'll be a bridge for the next few months where the Israelis and people like your, yourselves will reach out and be and take care of these people psychologically and financially. Thank you, Danny. Thanks for everything that you do. Any other uh, comments, questions, thoughts, reflections? Okay, uh, well, my, uh, people can keep the conversation going over email. Everybody should have my email address. I wanna, sh ev again, everyone, uh, happy, safe, and healthy, and meaningful Pesach, Festival of Freedom. Chag Echerut Sameach, everyone. Thanks, to you as well. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Bye, Ray. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> Wait, I didn't have to.